My dear brothers and sisters, today's uh, session is about the beginnings of the celebrations of Christmas in Sri Aurobindo Ashram Pondicherry. The credit for uh, the celebrations of Christmas in Sri Aurobindo Ashram Pondicherry goes to an intercontinental love affair. The boy or the young man in the affair was uh, Lawrence Pinto, born in Goa in 1907. After doing his engineering in Mumbai, he decided to go to England for further studies and the specialization that he chose was aeronautical engineering. Now one day it so happened that while he was in his office, he received a phone call. This phone call was from a young lady who was uh, doing some fundraising for a charity. You know, they go on making phone calls at random to people. And uh, one of the phone calls that she ended up making was to Lawrence Pinto. And uh, incredible as it may seem, both of them felt when they talked to each other briefly, a some sort of a magnetic pull in each other's voice. And so Lawrence decided to give her a check or something and uh, she went to collect it and that's how they ended up seeing each other. And uh, when they saw each other, that further reinforced that pull. You can say it was uh, love at first hearing and then reinforced by love at first sight. And uh, after that, there was no going back. This young lady was uh, Ethel. And uh, as may be expected, although they were both very good looking and uh, there was nothing obviously against the match, neither parents, neither his parents nor her parents were agreeable to the wedding. And uh, these two young persons, as is usually the case, were adamant. And at the same time, they wanted to have a wedding for which they did not want any help from their parents. And therefore, uh, what uh, Lawrence told Ethel was that, uh, I will uh, go to India, earn enough money to send you so that you can make a trip from England to India and then we'll get married in India. So with this he came back to India and uh, around 1934 and uh, started looking for a job. There was no job available for an aeronautical engineer because uh, at that time the total number of aeroplanes in India was exactly four. So there was no need for an aeronautical engineer to maintain aeroplanes. And another reason why he could not find a job was that uh, the British had blacklisted him because he had been seen participating in some meetings in England uh, which were organized by freedom fighters, you know, people who were working for the freedom of the country while be freedom of India while being in England. So they, he had been blacklisted. But the person who had been blacklisted by the British had been enlisted by the mother. And uh, let's see what, twist and, what twists and turns led to that, finally. So after he came to India and could not find a job, he started thinking of something else to do, maybe unrelated to his qualifications. And uh, that's how he landed in Pondicherry and started working with someone who was involved in export business Pondicherry was a free port and therefore there was plenty of import and export going on there and uh, there was a French man who was involved in export business there and uh, Udar, not sorry, Udar Lawrence went and uh, started working with him and uh, made some money and at the same time, in spite of being in Pondicherry, the ashram had been formally established in 1926 but uh, in spite of the ashram being already there, he had absolutely no attraction towards it. As he said that he was basically doing two things, making money and having a good time, whatever it may mean. 
So it took him about three years to make enough money to uh, send it to his uh, girlfriend and uh, she made a trip to Goa, sorry, to Pondicherry and uh, they got married in a church there and set up home. The year 1937 turned out to be very eventful for both of them in a way. Uh, not only that was the year during which uh, they got married, that was also the year during which uh, they started expecting a child and that was the year during which they also got attracted to the ashram and let's see how that happened. That happened because uh, ashram was close by. Lawrence might not be interested in going to the ashram but uh, some young people from the ashram got interested in coming there and the first one amongst them was Amal Kiranji. Uh, Amal Kiran was his uh, spiritual name given by Sri original name was K.D. Setna. He was from Mumbai. He was also young and uh, Lawrence had done his engineering in Mumbai. They had some common contacts and friends and somehow they got to meet each other and they got friendly and uh, first Amal Kiranji himself and then some other f young friends of his, they started going there and they started going there even more often after Lawrence got married because uh, all the so-called unyogic fun as uh, it has been called, they could have in a married couple's home was not possible and available and permitted in the ashram. So that's how it happened. And uh, the same year they got married in 1937, then these young people uh, told Udar, you may not be interested, but at least your wife may be interested and you can at least come and see the ashram once. So they decided to go to Sri Aurobindo Ashram Pondicherry on the Darshan day of 1937, 15th August, 15th August 1937, they decided to go to the ashram. And that itself became a turning point when they both saw Sri Aurobindo and the mother, they got captivated and particularly as uh, Lawrence says that he saw majesty, the royal majesty in a man dressed in a dhoti, something which was sort of unbelievable to him, got captivated. And uh, it was he in fact now who started trying to persuade his wife to move to the ashram and uh, they were so much in love with each other that she readily agreed. So the same year they moved to the ashram with a little daughter Gauri. So very eventful year, 1937. And uh, one can see that uh, this was the type of people who had been picked up by Sri Aurobindo and the mother because in a way they were barrier breakers, the harbingers of a new age. Imagine in those days a British girl and an Indian boy falling in love in England and then insisting on it and some succeeding to get married and successfully getting married and so on. All this was quite unusual, something unusual. But uh, apart from that, I mean, the way they were, uh, the type of bent of mind they had and the way they got captivated quickly and then made this quick decision to move to the ashram, they were not ordinary people. And uh, that's how they moved to the ashram and uh, on his next birthday after 1937, that is in April 1938, Sri gave Lawrence the name Udar, which means generous, it also means noble, truthful, sincere, because all these qualities go together without these other qualities like gratitude, sincerity, truthfulness, uh, one cannot be really generous. So that's how he got this name Udar and came to be known as Udar Pinto. And probably he himself had given another name to Ithel and that was Mona. And then asked Sri Aurobindo whether he would like to give her a name. But Sri Aurobindo said, no, Mona is fine because it reminds me of Mona Lisa. So she came to be known in the ashram as Mona Pinto and he as Udar Pinto. Now let's talk a little bit about uh, 
Udhar, you might be wondering that the topic was Christmas and I'm going on talking about this love affair and their marriage and moving to the ashram, but we'll see how they get linked up. Now this person, Udhar, he was a multifaceted person. And uh, I'll try to list some of the things that he did while in the ashram. But uh, the, in this book, from which I've got most of the material, Seven Dedicated Lives by Sunena Panda. Uh, she's talking about seven dedicated lives, the seven of the early disciples of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. And two of them were Lawrence uh, or the Udar and uh, Mona Pinto. So that's how both their biographies find a place in this book. She says, uh, Sunaina, you know, this author of this book, she says that uh, it will be much easier to list what Udar did not do rather than to list what he did. And uh, what came together in what he did was all the three major streams of yoga, that is Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga and Bhakti Yoga. He, has, he had Jnana of many types, spiritual inclination he had, he had the background of uh, the Bible, but apart from that he had technical knowledge, sound technical knowledge as an engineer, and he had dealt quite a bit with the outside world both here and in England, and he had contacts both in India and in England, directly and through his wife, and all this became a very valuable piece of gyan. And all this was pressed into service, into all the work that he did, the karma that he did. And all this karma became enjoyable for him and he became passionate about it because of his devotion to the Sri Aurobindo and the mother, particularly the mother. So all three came together and that's how he ended up doing all that he did. And uh, when he arrived, the planning for constructing a new home for the sadhaks was going on and uh, a generous grant for this a uh, new building had been provided by the Nizam of Hyderabad and uh, this was on the recommendations of Akbar Haidari and the architects who were uh, enlisted, some of the top architects of the world, from the western world, they had been roped in to prepare the designs. They were not just architects, they were also artists and they had given everything in meticulous detail, including the types of nuts and bolts to be used. Now this type of nuts and bolts were not available anywhere. And that is the point at which uh, Udar and Mona moved into the ashram and uh, the mother thought, here is the right man at the right time, for the right reason. Uh, she asked him to prepare, make, manufacture those nuts and bolts. This was one of his first assignments. and. Uh, they were to be made out of brass. She provided him all the old brass utensils that were available in the ashram, melt them and make nuts and bolts out of them. So that was his first assignment and he did that. And apart from that, he contributed in many other ways to the construction of that building, the polishing of the floor stones, the woodwork. And from that emerged the idea of having a workshop within the ashram and he established the workshop, the Harpagon workshop. And when he asked the mother how much money I'll have available or I'll need money for the equipment, etc., she took him to her cupboard where the money was kept, opened it and showed him how much money was there and she handed him exactly rupee one. So he understood that there's not much money available and he has to improvise things, manage with as little as possible. But then he was so passionate about it that he got completely involved in the construction of the workshop and he would forget to return home even for meals and sleep and he had to be literally dragged out of the workshop to go for the essentials like eating and sleeping. Then one of his next assignments was to make furniture for Sri Aurobindo's room because the old furniture was made of some very poor quality wood so good quality wood was purchased and then one of the requirements was that the dimensions of this furniture should be exactly as they were of the old because Sri Aurobindo and those who were taking care of him were used to that type of dimensions. So he designed that and made that 
furniture and uh, associated with this then got the maintenance of this furniture so she mother assigned him the duty of going and polishing and cleaning that furniture every day and he used to spend deliberately much longer than was necessary because that was the time when shurabindu was dictating savitri to niruddha so he enjoyed listening to the master himself dictating that scripture to niruddha and uh, he became a sort of that parrot who had heard everything that shiva was telling parvati there is a legend that uh, once shiva was giving uh, sacred knowledge to parvati in a cave in a cave because he didn't want anybody else to hear it because you know, this is one of the traditional injunctions that there are certain types of secret knowledge of the highest order in spirituality which should not be given away freely they should be given to only those who are receptive and eligible for it so he was trying to maintain that sort of a secrecy but in that cave where he was reciting all this to parvati there was a parrot who ended up here who ended up hearing all this and the result was that the parrot became a rishi and he then got born as rishi sukhadev so he became a sage a a rishi a seer because he heard all this so what uh, udar thought that he was also one such parrot listening to <laughs> the savitri as it was being dictated to niruddha and therefore he deliberately would sit in one corner behind some piece of furniture and just keep listening another of his assignments was to help in the construction of a sugar factory and then came the construction of uh, a theater and uh, the theater was ready around 1956 and uh, then there were performances there and udar became one of the actors to have major roles in those plays there would hardly be an example to find where somebody has constructed a theater and then himself acted in it then you know because of his knowledge of the outside world and business and export and all this he was then also made in charge of the purchase department of the ashram and then being an academic person he was also he started taking interest in education and he being an engineer and an educated person uh, they together he and uh, pranabda they together set the pattern of physical education in the ashram school and also decided what all equipment to buy where it to buy it from how to make one ourselves how to improvise equipment and so on all that was done by udar along with pranabda he became sort of one of the major pillars of the physical education department of the ashram and then being an engineer he also taught some engineering in the ashram school because an ashram school goes right from nursery level up to graduate level so he started teaching engineering there and then he was also doing the job of a reporter and a journalist he would make notes for every event going on in the ashram and then the bulletin which was a sort of a newsletter along with other things that would then carry his write ups on those events and then when shurabindu left the body in 1950 he was the one who was given the responsibility of designing and constructing shurabindu samadhi and as he later on revealed after the mother had left her body that the mother had that stage itself had told him that you make also it in such a way that there is a chamber also for my body to be buried at the same place when i leave my body so you can imagine that how painful it would have been for him to design the f- final resting place of the body of the one to whom he so devoted then you know he was also the master of ceremonies at uh, the foundation Uh, laying ceremony of oroville in 1968 in february 1968 and uh, an effort was being made to get the participation of as many countries in the world as possible you know uh, 
people from 124 countries came from a handful of soil from their own country and put it at the foundation of what is now Matri Mandir to sort of symbolize, give a physical expression to a, a, uh, a township which uh, was to be an international township, a place which, as the mother said, no country will consider as its own. So one of the countries that uh, an effort was being made to participate was Russia. Now being uh, communists, they did not believe in God. And uh, how to convince them to come to a place like this, which was meant to be for doing work for the divine. So then Udar stepped in and told them that you can just insert perfection instead of divine. And that was agreeable to them and that's how Russia also ended up participating. Man is imperfect, only God is perfect, so perfection is the same as the divine. But then perfection was acceptable to them, not the divine or God. In fact, I mean, he was uh, such a versatile person that, uh, uh, as you know, this, in this book says, Sunaina says, that if there was anything complex requiring a sort of a versatile approach from many angles, mother always enlisted it. And trusted, uh, and trusted it to Udar. And his devotion to the mother was total, uh, like that of Hanuman. And again, as she says in, in this book, that if the mother would have asked him to jump from the first floor, he would have done it without asking any question. That is the type of devotion he had. And that is what, it is because of this devotion that he was extremely passionate about what he did. And when he brought this passion rooted in devotion to the work that he did and the abilities that he had because of the knowledge that he had, it led to that perfection which you get only from the combination of uh, all the three, knowledge, action and devotion. And uh, one of the stories I picked up from Karuna Didi, you know, in this ashram was that once he had come to Delhi and uh, then he decided to go back after a very short visit on a particular day. And why he wanted to do on that particular day was because, you know, there were clocks in the Pondicherry ashram and those days the clocks didn't have a battery or a cell, they had, they had to be wound. And uh, some good ones may last a week or something, but then you had to wind them, otherwise they'll stop. So it was his duty to wind those clocks and uh, because that was the day on which he was supposed to wind them, he said he must return so that he can go and do that. So that was the type of dedication he had uh, to his duty. His, the departure was determined by when he was supposed to go and wind those clocks in Pondicherry. Now let's turn to his partner, Mona. She was a remarkable person. As remarkable as was her birthday, she was born on the 11th of number, November 1911. And uh, so it was 11-11-11. And another similar thing was, after uh, Lawrence came back to, and told her that I'll earn enough money to, for you to be able to travel, she said that she waited for him for three years, three months, and three days <laughs> before she could come. Now, why, when they moved into the ashram in 1937, that is the time when Golconde, Golconde, it was named Golconde because the money had come from the Nizam of Hyderabad and uh, she mother wanted some link between Hyderabad and uh, this, uh, in this uh, home for the sadhaks, which eventually then became a guest house. But uh, she wanted a connection and that's why you know, Golconda Fort is in Hyderabad. So that's why Golconde. <clears throat> so, that was being designed. So, while uh, Udar was given all these duties of making nuts and bolts and designing furniture and so on and so forth, she was given the task of homekeeping, housekeeping, designing linen and all that, embroidery and whatever. So, she st started doing that and in fact she continued to do this housekeeping along with all the other work that she did there for that guest house, Golkunde guest house, till the last day till she left her body around the age of 90 plus, at 90 plus, 
she continued to do that. And one of the stories that uh, uh, is worth mentioning here from that uh, guest house is that uh, once a doctor who knew some uh, resident of the ashram, who in turn, uh, so this doctor who knew this resident in the ashram uh, came to stay there. And uh, he put his uh, hand back carelessly on one of the tables in his room and dragged it and while dragging it the table got scratched. And it seems that uh, Mona uh, might have scolded him for having spoiled the furniture. So this person being connected to a senior resident of the ashram told him and then this person in turn uh, told Sri Aurobindo. He wrote a letter to Sri Aurobindo. Nobody could meet him, so he wrote a letter to Sri Aurobindo. And Sri Aurobindo replied back in a letter. And uh, I'll just read out a few lines from that letter. Now here is Sri Aurobindo's sense of humor. Uh, it was as much a tragedy for the table as for the doctor. <laughs> so the doctor to get scolded by Mona was a tragedy, but probably it was yeah, at least as big a tragedy for the table to get scratched. <laughs> And then he goes on to say, uh, a few lines later, if I had been in the doctor's place, I would have been grateful to her, that is grateful to Mona, for her care and solicitude, instead of being upset by what ought to have been for him, trifles, although because of her responsibility, they had for her their importance. So might, what might have been only a minor thing, a little scratch on a table, what might have been trifles or a minor thing for the doctor, was to her because of the responsibility she had and the dedication she had to her work, for her they were major things, they were important things. So it's all relative and therefore she did the right thing in a way. Now she remained right till the end as much British as Indian. And that actually helped in housekeeping and taking care of minute details, as you might have noticed from the scratch, this incident of the scratch. Uh, the type of perfection that uh, the Western world has brought to the physical or material sphere is something which is really remarkable. And, uh, and therefore, uh, uh, in integral yoga, where uh, outer work is just as important as inner work, this perfection is also a part of the sadhana, part of the spiritual seeking. And uh, therefore, in a way, in, a, in Shurabindu and the mother also, we ended up getting uh, the best of the both, the best of the both the Eastern and the Western world, India being more suited to inner work and the West to the Western world. We got that combination in Shurabindu and the mother. And the similar combination again in Udar and Mona, one from the East, one from the West. and. Uh, we got this combination. But then she also had that in, picked up the, or had inherent in her, maybe because of all that came with her from previous lives, that uh, Indian opening of uh, opening towards spirituality and immense degree of empathy for the poor. Uh, all the staff that she worked for her in there, including the uh, those who just kept the place clean, uh, all of them received immense love from her. She would take care that they are comfortable and happy and uh, in difficult times provide all the support to them. And she picked up the lang local language. She would speak Tamil in the British accent and uh, sort of completely got sort of uh, integrated into the atmosphere there. She has been described, you know, again, Vesvinayana in this, as the goddess of practical sense. So, it is because of this practical sense, along with uh, being, also again she says, along with being an eternal romantic and a dreamer. So, a very unusual sort of a combination. On one hand, an eternal romantic and a dreamer, and on the other hand, a, the goddess of practical sense. Now, again, just as they were the right persons at the right time for the construction of the Golconde uh, guest house, they were also the right persons for the school to start 
the school and ashram uh, in the Pondicherry ashram started because of the entry of children. And the children came there because of the Second World War. Because before that, there was no children. And the children came because of the Second World War because many Indians went to uh, fight in the World War. And Sri Aurobindo was quite supportive of it because he wanted that all we could we should also help England in uh, fighting the Nazi forces because the mother and Sri Aurobindo believed that uh, if Hitler wins, then it will take the world back several centuries in terms of the evolution of consciousness. And therefore, uh, and they were supportive and the, those who were going to fight in the war, uh, many of them felt that Pondicherry was the safest place to be, not only because it was a French colony, but also because uh, of the protection that they would get from the mother and Sri Aurobindo. So many of them left their families, their wives and children in the Pondicherry ashram. And that is how quite a large number of children ended up coming in the early 1940s. So this couple was there and then Mona thought that uh, let the children have some fun. So she started inviting in 1944 the children to her house on Christmas Day. So that is how the Christmas began. And uh, the children enjoyed going there. And then the mother thought, why should only the children have all the fun? So she made it a more general celebration in the playground. And uh, then, you know, it continued in the playground, but in the playground, you know, weather being uh, a little uh, unpredictable, very often it would rain or something. So then it was, after the theater was ready, it was shifted to the theater in 1956, 58. The theater came up in 1956, 1958 onwards, it moved to the theater, these Christmas celebrations. And then the mother looked upon it not as uh, the celebration of the birth of Christ, as it is commonly thought, because in fact historians now say that probably Christ was not even born on 25th December, he was born on a different date. And uh, this was just sort of uh, taking up one of the festivals which preceded Christianity by the Christians and giving it the name of Christmas and treating it as the birthday of Jesus Christ. Uh, so, I mean, things which are as much as more than 2,000 years old, all these confusions do occur. But then, how did it precede the celebration of Christmas? How did, does it go f much further back than these 2,000 years? That happened because uh, the pagans, the, those who, you know, who are considered sort of uh, relatively uncivilized and irreligious people, as the Christians call them, pagans, they had a celebration on 25th December because that is the day on which the days start getting longer. Actually, it is 21st December, but there might have been some mistake in their calculations. So they thought that 25th December is the beginning of longer days. Now you might say that's a minor thing, why have such a celebration for the days becoming a little longer? We don't realize it because for us the difference between the length of the day and uh, in, the, in December and in June is not that much. But if you go to the further north, places which are much colder and also where this difference is much bigger, we can understand it. Because if you go to say England or to Canada or some such place, you may find in, uh, in the month of December that uh, the sun does not rise till 10 or 11 in the morning and by the time it is 4 in the evening, it is sunset. It's dark at night. So the day is extremely short and the day is so cold that very often it is foggy. So having uh, no bright sunlight, just a little dim light, uh, fog, snow, cold, a grey atmosphere during the day and a very long night. Now, when that ends and brings the hope that now gradually the days will be longer and eventually in summers we'll have sunlight is, the, is a reason for celebration. In fact, even now, I mean, in spite of all the heating and all that now they have in the West in their homes, the number of suicides in winter is much greater than in summers. Because winter is a depressing atmosphere. It's a depression, depressing atmosphere to see all that grey atmosphere and all that. Whereas, uh, if you go in the summers, on any bright sunny day, because even in summers all their days are not bright and sunny, you'll find that the beaches are all full of people. 
They go and lie down there and bask in the sun. Such a luxury. So for them, light returning is a major thing. So they consider it the descent of light or the rebirth of light and that is how the mother looked at it and that is how it got, it was being celebrated. Light is not just the, something that we enjoy to lift up our mood, light is also symbolic of knowledge. Darkness is symbolic of ignorance. So that is how the mother, uh, sort of, that's the color that the mother gave to the celebration of Christmas in uh, the Pondicherry ashram. Now the celebration also included giving away gifts for which there was no money available. And uh, then again, Mona stepped in with her organizational skills. A room was reserved in the basement of Golconda guest house in which whatever objects became available during the year which could be used as gifts were given. Some of these were donations, some of these were made by hand, you know, handicrafts and all that which the ashram people made. Some of these uh, were improvised, for example, used tennis balls. They could not, when they could no longer be used as tennis balls, they were painted, dyed, made beautiful and then kept for children to be given away as gifts on Christmas. So throughout the year, objects kept collecting and then near Christmas they were wrapped up and while they were collecting they were also kept in separate heaps uh, so that they would be sorted out in terms of age, what type of gift would be suitable for what age group. So all that sorting and classification was going on throughout the year and towards the end of Christmas all what was required to wrap them up beautifully and make gifts out of them. Now all this was involved a lot of hard work and as Simona said later that she would not have perhaps made it so elaborate and done the, put in all this year long effort if it had not been for the mother who was herself deeply interested, keen on this type of a celebration of the Christmas. And uh, therefore, uh, and on then of course Udar would participate in this in many ways, but he was also the one who became the Christmas father with that red dress, that usual red dress and cap and that long white beard. So he would be the one who's act, who would act as Christmas father. And uh, therefore, as Sunaina says in this book, uh, that uh, all over the world people only have a Christmas father, we also had a Christmas mother in Mona. So, So as you can see, uh, closely tied up with uh, the celebration of Christmas is the story of these two persons, Mona and uh, Udar Pinto. And uh, just as it was for many other types of tasks, particularly the Golconde Fort, Golconde, Golconde Guest House, uh, just as it was for that, that they were the right people to arrive at the right time, uh, they were also the right people to arrive at the right time for many other types of work, including the celebration of Christmas. So you can see that uh, although Christmas was only a minor or small part of all that they did, it also is rooted in their arrival in the ashram. And uh, so every line and curve has a meaning as you can see. If you now look back it's always easy to look, in, look back in retrospect and then connect the dots. If you do that, then you'll find that uh, Udar having decided to go to England to study aeronautical engineering when he could have easily got the job as an engineer in India. It, perhaps that super specialization was not really necessary at that stage to get a job as an engineer. He's deciding to go and study aeronautical engineering in those days when there were hardly any aeroplanes in India. And then she making a phone call to him and they finding that magnetic pull and then finally deciding to, against all odds, to actually get married and waiting for each other for more than three years for it to materialize, all that was. And in those days, three years meant really three years of isolation because there was no email, no WhatsApp, no smartphones. All they could do to communicate was to write a letter which will take about two weeks to reach the other country and that too, if at all it reaches. In those days, they waited for each other for more than three years. As she said, exactly three years, three months and three days. So all that happening, incredible story, with a meaning, 
and that's how two persons who are to play a unique role in uh, the movement initiated by Shorabindu and the mother, a movement which was to touch the human race. Uh, in that, these two persons born thousands of miles apart, coming together and contributing together as a couple, along with their daughter Gauri, to the ashram was something really remarkable. So this is how the divine design works, as you can see in retrospect, uh, to achieve these incredible things. Just as when Shirobindo and the mother again born thousands of miles apart, but then just at the right time, actually making a contact at the physical level. The mother making her first visit to Pondicherry in 1914 to trigger the publication of Arya, and the second visit and the final visit in 1920 to give a practical shape to their philosophy, because her philosophy, her way of looking at spirituality was exactly the same as that of Sri Aurobindo. So, all those thousands of miles don't matter what matters is, what the design is, if it has to happen, it will happen at the right time, in the right way, and for right reasons. So this is what uh, this story of celebration of Christmas in Sri Ashram Pondicherry is and uh, this place being a continuation of Sri Ashram Pondicherry also celebrates it in the same way and uh, gifts are given here too, all that is sort of done in the same way as was done in Pondicherry. <coughs> so all such places do build up their traditions and as you can see this is one of the traditions, one of the celebrations that uh, has become a part of Aurobindonian institutions and it is as a celebration of the rebirth of light or the descent of light. <clears throat>